feel free to use chat, everyone. Use Q&A. If you have a second right now, go to brandclub.la. We've set up a Slack channel for brands and marketers uh, all over the country that we've been running all our events through. So the link is right there. You can go ahead and click it. And yeah, it's a chance to connect with people. We basically use it for all our different events. So it's a good opportunity to connect with people and keep the conversation going. And with that, uh, thank you for joining us today. So today we're, we will learn how to take the next steps in your Facebook advertising journey by exploring commerce products that brands can use to master the art of high performance marketing on the Facebook platform. Uh, before we dive right in, I would love to let everyone know to head over to the Brand Club LA Slack, where you will all get to chat with one another and us throughout the webinar. In addition, we will be taking Q&A at the end of today's session, so feel free to use the Q&A function here on Zoom or chat or Slack. We'll monitor it all. Um, and I would love to now welcome Morgan Tierney with Facebook, who for the next hour will be discussing how you can leverage Facebook commerce to maximize your revenue. In addition to learning how to navigate one of the most popular platforms in the world and get an inside scoop on Instagram shops. Take this opportunity, guys. Morgan's awesome. She really knows her stuff. So she's going to spend the next hour really diving in. And this is not a common thing people get to do. Facebook doesn't do this a lot. So glad you all showed up. Thank you for getting up early. And uh, thank you, Morgan. Go ahead and jump on in. Awesome. Thanks for the great intro, Eric. Thanks, everybody, for joining. I know it's a little bit early on the West Coast. I'm located in Austin. Um, so I appreciate you, guys, appreciate you guys getting up and early to tune in with us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen and we'll get things rolling. Cool. Um, I might just get a yes or no from you. Kyle, can you see it? Yes, perfect. Love yep. it. Thanks, guys. Awesome. So we're going to be walking through broader commerce solutions at Facebook talking more specifically around a new concept that has been coined uh, titled discovery commerce that's really focused on not just um, you know businesses finding people who might enjoy their products but products actually finding people in, in a new format in an interesting way across our platforms. And so we're going to kick things off with a broader focus on what is discovery commerce, really what is commerce on Facebook. Uh, and that includes commerce across basically all of family, uh, Facebook's family of apps and services. So we're talking Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, WhatsApp, and how all those play together. And then we'll take a deeper dive in the second half into uh, basically commerce and shopping on Instagram. So really diving deep into what do some of these features look like? And then the basically the latter half is really heavily focused on some creative examples. So I wanted to take some time to make sure everybody on the uh, webinar today and joining the summit gets a chance to really see what these um, basically commerce products look like in action. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. And so as we look forward at what commerce will look like in the future, we really need to understand the evolution of commerce throughout history. And so for hundreds of years, shopping and buying was a relationship that was really initiated by a person's need and fulfilled by a shopkeeper's expertise. Um, and that shopkeeper in a traditional store could offer personalized recommendations, a store experience to really create moments of discovery and a simple exchange of payment and goods. And the transformation really began when people started to use the connectivity of the web to buy and to sell. And it really accelerated in 1995 with the launch of eBay and Amazon. The industry began to turn to the web as an innovative, innovative way to sell and to transact with people. Thus, electronic commerce was born and coined. And really out of the gates, e-commerce was seen as experimental as it dwarfed in comparison to offline sales. Businesses weren't set up to do this kind of fulfillment and financial tooling was really limited. But the infrastructure began to form, including the rise of search as the killer app for the web. This has been the playbook for the last 30 years and the convenience of e-commerce is moving more people to buy online. A misconnected world has given people infinite choice and total control 
over what they watch, read, interact with, and buy. We expect things to be tailored to our tastes and in the formats that we prefer. People are in control and we expect more relevant and personal experiences. And that's why it's never been more important for businesses to know their customers and to anticipate their needs. We're seeing the following shifts in broader consumer expectations. When we think about discovery, how people discover products has largely changed. Rather than going into a physical store, especially during this time, people and brands are sharing and discovering products all day, every day on social platforms. That looks like a brand sharing an item that fulfills a need that you might have or a friend messaging you a product that they think that you'd love. And in fact, 52% of online brand discovery happens in public social feeds. As we think about immediacy, people's expectations around convenience have largely changed. People expect immediacy. In many ways, it's never been easier to buy something. Anything can be purchased anytime with a click of the button and can arrive at your door, sometimes within hours. And because people have come to expect a quick and easy experience, uh, people will leave if they don't get it. And so cart abandonment accounts for at least 50% of attrition from business purchase funnels, costing e-commerce marketers two to $4 trillion a year. When we think about personalization, the mass adoption of services like Netflix and Spotify have created a new expectation for one-to-one -one personalization. Netflix's personalization engine is so good, it accounts for almost 80% of the shows and movies viewed on the platform. It's not just Netflix lovers that appreciate the personalized touch. 91% of consumers say they are more likely to shop with brands that provide offers and recommendations that are relevant to them. And when people shop online, they want to know that their payment information will be kept safe. Globally, 65% of online shoppers express extreme concern about data privacy, and one in two people say they'd pay more for products with assurances of safety and quality. And with more options than ever, 84% of shoppers will bring their business elsewhere if they've had a poor experience. And as of recently, these consumer expectations have accelerated exponentially. As a result of COVID-19, we've seen 10 years of digital transformation take place in the span of two months. And in the global e-commerce market is largely expected to grow from 1.8 trillion in 2019 to 2.4 trillion in 2020. If history is any indication, these new norm behaviors that are taking hold may stick. And in today's landscape, a leaning forward business can no longer wait for people to actively shop and search for them. If e-commerce is about connecting the right person to the right product, the other kind of experience, something that we're calling, we're calling discovery commerce, is really about connecting the right product to the right person. It's about driving discovery, demand, and delight while respecting people's right to privacy. It's about collapsing the journey between discovery and action. Today, more than ever, businesses need efficient strategies to meet people where they are and the closed measurement loop to know that those strategies are working. And so brands that have made digital their top priority, like direct to consumer brands are in a strong position to future proof their business. Brands that haven't will need to prioritize the broader shift to digital. And it's not gonna be just about fulfilling demand or fulfilling orders or fulfilling shipments, but really about creating demand. Businesses will need to meet their customers where they are and personalize their online experience from discovery to purchase to post-purchase. And Facebook is known for personalized and relevant advertising. Serving one-to-one -one experiences based on people's unique interests is our superpower. And that's likely how you, how you probably know the platform best today. For example, if uh, you were, let's say you're marketing a pair of shoes, you might create a variety of creative with different talking points about those shoes, that they're stylish, that they're eco-friendly, that they're comfortable. And we know which customers have a preference for comfort over style. And so the system will select the comfort forward creative instead of the other assets to show a comfort focused shopper. 
and really this is like i think this is a really good like way to take a step back and look at the broader ecosystem and kind of understand how everything works. So each one of uh, Facebook's apps is really rooted in customer centric experiences. And because of that, we deeply understand people uh, beyond their demographics. And so when you share what you know about your customers, you help the system find people that are gonna be most valuable to your business. And so powerful machine learning technology synthesizes that data to deliver the most relevant experience to each person. And um, with commerce, as we move to commerce, people can take action immediately, checking out on your site or even, or even completing a purchase without leaving uh, the Facebook platform. And the data collected from these interactions can help businesses reach even more new customers. And with the insights gathered throughout the process, the system becomes ultimately better optimized to create even more demand and to grow your business better. And this continuously improving system is what makes Facebook the home of discovery commerce. And so let's go ahead and dive into the commerce component of our system. I think that's really what everybody is on the, the summit for today. And Facebook has always been about connecting people to what they love. And more often than you might think, a lot of those connections lead to commerce. So for years, people have used our apps to buy and sell things. From the early days of posting a photo of a bicycle with a caption for sale, to selling your coffee table on Marketplace. And now, shopping styles from favorite brands and influencers on Instagram. It was really the people who used our apps who envisioned social commerce. We're now just helping them make it a reality. We want to make it easier for people to discover and shop for the things that they love. And much of what we've built our business is in response to those consumer behaviors that we now see on the platforms. And there are now around 3.1 billion people using Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, or Messenger each month to connect with family, friends, communities, and the businesses that they love. 180 million businesses use our apps every month Nearly one business for every 55 people on the planet all use Facebook systems of solutions to connect with our customers and drive growth for their business. Big brands use our services alongside coffee shops, barber shops, and restaurants. And for every one of those 180 million, there are people earning livelihoods and customers using our products and services. Nine million of those businesses out of the 180 million on the platform 9 million of them advertise across Facebook's family of apps. And so because of this, we have a really, really large market opportunity to help connect brands and people in, in meaningful and interesting ways. And so during this critical time, you know, a lot of people are working from home. You guys are um, kind of zooming into my bedroom. Um, you know, Facebook is really focusing on accelerating its work to enable every business to sell online and double down on commerce. Um, and so through these investments, we're weaving shopping into the fabric of our apps to help people gather inspiration, discover, and largely um, buy the products that they love. And so our vision as we think about discovery commerce headed into the future is to create one unified shopping experience across all of Facebook's apps. And so for shoppers, each shopping experience is gonna be slightly different, utilizing what is best about each app to improve their shopping experience. So for example, in the Facebook app, shoppers will be able to see likes and shares from their friends and community to know what they like. On Instagram, shoppers can express themselves by getting the latest releases at exclusive, exclusive drops first from the brands that they're most interested in. The product is really just in its early stages, but as we build out more features, each app, or excuse me, each app will add unique value, um, making it worthwhile to consider how to build your brand and sell your products uh, specifically across all of them. And so as we invest in commerce, our goal is to create better shopping experiences for people and address what modern businesses need today. And so we're going to take a look uh, across four different um, topics to kick things off. 
starting with Facebook shops, moving into discovery through shoppable content, onto shopping destinations, and finally, um, you know, kind of wrapping our initial session with messaging and seamless interactions. And so it all starts really by establishing your storefront. Facebook Shops is the biggest step that we've taken yet to enable commerce across Facebook's apps. Shops makes it easier for businesses to set up their digital storefront and to sell things online. This means that there is one shopping experience across Facebook's apps and any changes that you make to a shared collection in your shop will go live across all of the apps. And so today, customers can message a business through WhatsApp, Messenger, or Instagram direct to ask questions, get support, track deliveries, and more. And in the future, customers will be able to view a business's shop and make purchases right within a chat in WhatsApp, Messenger, or Instagram direct. And so we think about curating products for your customers. Um, you can actually organize groups of products into collections themed around seasonal events, promotions, upcoming launches, or trends that you've noticed from your followers. You'll be able to help your customers find the products that are right for them. And additionally, you'll be able to customize your brand, uh, or excuse me, customize your shop for your brand. So brands can ultimately stand out from the crowd and express their brand voice through visual merchandising. Simply choose that basically the products that you want uh, to feature from your catalog and then customize the look and feel of the shop with a cover image and accent colors that showcase your brand. And so as we um, jump right along, we are gonna take a look at basically discovery through shoppable content. And so we're making it easier for new customers to discover products where they're already spending their time, whether they're browsing for inspiration or have an idea on what product they're looking for. And our recommendation is to make your content shoppable and actionable with shopping tags on Instagram. I'm not gonna dive too deep into this right now as we're gonna hit on it in the later half of the 30 minutes. Um, but I think the, the features with which you can um, set up product tags and actually run ads with product tags is one of the really most compelling new features of our commerce suite of products. In addition, addition to Instagram, businesses can also use shopping tags on Facebook to highlight products from their catalog and newsfeed and live shopping so people can learn more and easily take action on products that they're really interested in. And to dive a little bit deeper into live, we're building live shopping solutions across Facebook and Instagram because we saw that people wanted to buy products that were featured in live video. While we're still in early days, our live shopping solutions across Facebook and Instagram will enable people to connect with sellers more easily when they see something that they like at any time during a live video. Uh, that first video on the left was a Taiwanese fashion brand, Lulu's, who ran a campaign that combined a Facebook live event featuring fashion influencers with targeted mobile first ads on Facebook and Instagram they saw a 1.6x return for mobile purchases from that live. And in the middle, you can see Singaporean fashion label MDS Collections, who started using live video to sell products before we built a product to support it. They pivoted their business model from 80% offline to online with the help of Facebook's creative shop. And they used Facebook Live to pre-launch their new collections and invited customers to try on their clothing and share their style tips. So MDS Collection saw a 20% increase in total sales after trying live video to sell on Facebook. And then lastly here, uh, Indonesian commerce company Tokopedia combined influencer paid and organic content to take over Instagram Live. They mobilized a community of deal seekers asking customers to show that they were ready to sprint and grab the offers. 1,700 people participated in the takeover and the event reached over 1.1 million people. So we're really seeing like mass reach of, of some of these large takeovers from the live perspective. 
And, you know, I think as we move more towards an uh, authentic experience across our platforms, you've probably seen that trend yourself. Um, you know, folks don't necessarily want to see just like um, a dress on a model. They really want to understand what it looks like um, and like how it feels and how it moves. And so that's really where live can kind of give you a little bit more um, transparency into purchasing a product and really feeling comfortable about your purchase when you just don't have the option to go in and like see it in person. And so lastly, we recommend amplifying discovery and uh, consideration broadly with our commerce ad solutions. And so we're currently building ads and other new discovery points to help drive traffic directly to business shops. And just last week, we launched ads with product tags where advertisers can launch campaigns directly from ads manager, linking their products in their ads. And we also recently launched shopping custom audiences, which allow businesses to continue to engage with customers who interacted with their products in a shopping experience on Instagram and Facebook. Businesses will now be able to create shopping custom audiences based on people that took a shopping related action. So let's say they viewed a product detail page on our commerce products, such as Facebook page shops and Instagram shopping. So if the business is checkout enabled, the business can also create custom audiences based on people who added a product to their cart and people who purchased a product. So what we're seeing is really just even more refined targeting options that are gonna become available with our commerce suite of products. Cool, so moving right along, we are going to jump to a quick overview of shopping destinations where we are basically making it easier for new customers to discover your products where they're already browsing and shopping. And so we recently launched Instagram shop, which is a new way to discover and buy products you love in Instagram Explore. Globally, Instagram shop features personalized recommendations to people based on the accounts that they already follow and businesses using Instagram shopping. People in the US will also be able to browse collections curated by the shop team, an account created by our Instagram team that celebrates emerging businesses and the creators behind those businesses. In the future, consumers will be able to access Instagram shop through the, des the designated shop tab where they're already in a consideration mindset. So this is an early testing and will be fully rolled out in November but you can think about it similar to like an entry point for Explore on Instagram right now. There will be a shop tab where you can actually go and, and browse more specific products that you might be related, basically interested in. Awesome. So um, moving right along, we are going to jump into messaging and seamless interactions. So um, let's take a second and talk a little bit about messaging. Sometimes people can get a little bit confused about how messaging fits into the commerce suite of solutions. But broadly, if you think about offline behavior, um, you know, you're talking to a sales associate, you're um, asking them about availability, potential of when something might come back in stock, et cetera. So um, really where messaging fits in is similar to that in an online experience. And so um, what's coming soon to our products um, is going to be the availability to message businesses through um, Messenger and actually like purchase products in that capacity as well. And so you can actually uh, purchase products directly in a chat that's going to be rolling out across WhatsApp, Messenger and Instagram. Um, in the next, I would say, probably like three to four months. Um, and you'll also be able to have a little bit more of like a seamless communication with the business as you're looking to um, largely better understand like the products that are available and also have conversations around like potential returns, et cetera. And businesses today can share shop links within their communications. So you can see that on the left-hand side 
where you can actually uh, copy the link of a product description page and message it to your friend and say like, hey, I think this is something that you would really like. And as opposed to like a really long URL appearing, um, similar to maybe what you see in iMessage, they can actually just keep, see like a quick little like image and price point, um, which will help to drive a little bit more of that commerce activity on our platforms as well. And so moving over to seamless transactions, um, checkout on Instagram and Facebook is going to be enabled by Facebook or is currently enabled by Facebook Pay and it makes it quick, easy and um, basically like seamless for people to buy the products they discover without having to leave the app. We're really excited about the potential of checkout to provide frictionless experiences for customers on Facebook and Instagram, but we are also still in the really early days. Um, currently, checkout is only available to businesses in the US. Um, and other regions and businesses who aren't interested in checkout can still drive discovery across Facebook's apps uh, and choose to send customers to checkout on their own e-commerce site. Um, I think checkout's super exciting, especially as we think about uh, a frictionless experience and some of the drop-off that we see when customers you know, have to enter their credit card and they maybe don't have it on hand. I know that's happened to me countless times. Um, so having that connectivity um, that's all backed by Facebook Pay is, is really going to make shopping on our platforms a lot more seamless and straightforward. And so to speak to Facebook Pay a little bit more, we're slowly rolling out Facebook Pay on Messenger to allow for people to pay for products seamlessly when they're messaging with the business. And we're also rolling it out on WhatsApp, which is currently testing in Brazil. Cool. So um, creating a shop gives a business access to commerce experience experiences across Facebook's apps. And so by creating a shop, you'll have access to these customer facing commerce experiences that we talked about today. And the back end technology to our commerce platform powers the tools the businesses need to run efficient and successful e commerce businesses. And this technology includes shop creation. Uh, shopping custom audiences, catalog management, ads creation, insights, measurement tools, et cetera. And I wanted to just flag here too, for businesses that do decide to leverage checkout, uh, you can see there's additional offerings that roll out. Um, so product tags with mentions, um, shopping with creators, live shopping. So those are some of the additional benefits that come alongside integrating with checkout. And so what can you do today? I think it really is, is helpful to partner with an agency on these things um, as it relates to understanding commerce across the landscape more broadly. Um, there's a lot of players that are participating in commerce online right now. I think a lot of people are, are recognizing that um, online shopping behaviors are continuing to grow. And so as you try to come up with a commerce plan um, on Facebook, leveraging the different products that are available, um, partnering with an agency like Hawk is gonna be a really effective way to help um, essentially just get efficient and strategic support on building a more holistic strategy. You can read the slide that's in front of you around um, establishing a storefront, measuring results, uh, and, and kind of using additional like insight and feedback to break down some organizational silos that, that maybe are hindering some of the performance that you'd like to see on the digital front. And I wanted to include in here um, a quote from um, the CEO of Shopify, who was just speaking to the fact that a lot of these big um, online platforms are seeing that commerce is going to be a really, really massive shift and uh, really, really powerful from a performance perspective to have the tools built natively into the platform. And so we are going to jump straight into Instagram shopping, which is super exciting. I think this is going to be a, a really good part of, of this conversation. As we're going to dive deeper into the features, I, I kind of alluded to that earlier. And so I want to give you guys a bit of a better look at what those features look like and then take some time to really think about, okay, how are people doing this creatively now? Because uh, I think 
sometimes it's just really necessary to get some inspiration as you think about building out a strategy for yourself. So we're in our really early days with Instagram shopping and yet we've already learned a lot. So we know that people find joy in stumbling on new things on Instagram. And we wanna make it easy to shop right when you find something that you like. And so in fact, so really most of what we have built uh, our business around as it relates to commerce is really in response to people's current behaviors. And it's really no secret that more and more people are shopping online. So by next year, more than one in two e-commerce sales are expected to be mobile e-commerce sales. And COVID has accelerated this. Uh, it's, it's not expected to be a short-term change. 85% of people globally are now shopping online. And much of this growth can also be attributed to the ease of online shopping. You can buy nearly anything you need on your phone. 75% of US shoppers agree, saying that the internet makes it easier to buy things immediately after you learn about them. I think about it myself. Um, I was shopping for uh, a rug yesterday that my friend had sent me for my kitchen and I hadn't even planned to buy a rug for my kitchen. But after seeing the product online and thinking about it for an hour or two, um, I decided, hey, I think I would really like this and it would be it would be a cool addition. And so that's kind of the concept of like creating demand where there wasn't demand before. And, and um, the interplay between the social aspect where people are you know sending each other products and sh can share them really easily as well as generating the demand that's really where discovery commerce uh, comes into play and we know that shopping isn't just about accomplishing a quick task on your phone oops jumped ahead um, it's really about discovering new things that you love and things that you want to make your own slide just wants to. So we'll just move on. <laughs> um, but like, largely speaking, we're, we're kind of looking at some stats here as we think about um, businesses on Instagram. We know that 90% um, of people follow a business on Instagram, with 62% of people globally saying that they like to see photos or videos from creators. And 51% of luxury customers wanting to see new trends on Instagram. So people are curating their own worlds in which they are inspired. And much of this is happening on our platform. Instagram has opened new doors for people to discover new things that they would have never discovered otherwise. Uh, it's like an emerging designer that you happen upon in your feed or a merch launch from a meme artist or that new influencer collection that you stumbled upon in stories. And in fact, 84% of people say they want to discover new products on Instagram. And since our earliest days, people have come to Instagram to shop. They open the app to see new trends and ideas that interested them, like a skincare tutorial, outfit of the days, or new products from their favorite brand. And when they were inspired by something they saw, they took steps to find it right away. People got creative using comments and direct messages to ask about availability and price, screenshotting items to find them later, or they left Instagram to search for it. And we broadly learned that Instagram was the new way to shop. So we created Instagram shopping to make it easy for people to shop right in the moment of discovery. Our vision is that people can discover and shop photos and videos anywhere in our app when inspiration strikes. In fact, 46% of people say they abandoned a purchase when there were too many steps to complete it. I, I mean, it's kind of crazy that nearly 50% of people have completely abandoned a purchase due to a clunky checkout. And so with Instagram shopping, ultimately what we wanna do is to help reduce that friction. And so what exactly is it? It's a set of features that allow people uh, to shop photos and videos all across Instagram. And we're gonna do a quick Instagram shopping glossary, which I think is gonna be a super helpful uh, level set to take a look at um, what are all the available products that, that we're talking about. So to kick things up, 
shops uh, are an immersive full screen storefront that enable businesses to build their brand story and drive product discovery all in a native shopping experience. These can be accessed directly from your Instagram um, handle where there's actually a shops tab. And we've built shopping tags for businesses to tag products across Instagram so people can easily shop wherever they find joy in the app. Uh, shopping tags allow businesses to highlight products from their catalog in stories and in feed so people can learn more. And businesses that use checkout on Instagram can highlight products in feed captions and in their link in bios with product mentions. Collections allow businesses to curate the shopping experience by surfacing products into themes that tell a story in their shop. And product detail pages showcase all relevant information on an item, including pricing, rich descriptions, and media. Um, product detail pages are like usually shortened as PDPs, but PDPs pull in media where the product is tagged on Instagram so that people can see the products used in a number of different ways. And shopping ads, which uh, like I mentioned, just launched last week, allow businesses to boost existing shopping posts and launch ads in ads manager with tagged products to reach audiences at scale. Uh, Instagram shop is an in-app shopping destination where people can discover products and brands that they love across Instagram. We talked about this one a little bit. And then checkout on Instagram allows businesses to sell their products directly on Instagram. It's available to all US businesses that meet our commerce eligibility requirements. Um, I know it was in a closed alpha for a while. So if folks aren't aware that they can actually onboard onto checkout now, you definitely can. And, um, you know, I think there's a lot of these meaningful next uh, tools that we're going to run through that are really just eligible whenever you have checkout. So I think it's something to watch if you are specifically interested in some of the products that might be gated to, to those who are using checkout. Uh, and one of those being shopping from creators. So it makes it possible for people to shop inspiring looks from the creators that they love without leaving Instagram. Um, this is currently available to checkout sellers Product launches are a way for businesses to announce an upcoming launch on Instagram so people can preview details and set reminders to buy as soon as possible. This is also currently available for checkout shoppers. And live shopping unlocks a new channel for businesses to share products with their customers. Businesses can tag products and live broadcasts that customers can purchase in real time. And shop is a shoppable real-time reflection of our community's interests across top shopping categories like fashion, beauty, home decor, and more. So with the full suite of shoppable features, there truly is a shopping strategy for every business, big or small, to grow on Instagram. And there are 130 million people tapping to reveal a shoppable tag every month across stories, in feed, and more. And people encounter shoppable content all over. So the path to shopping is not linear on Instagram, which presents an opportunity for businesses to meet shoppers wherever they're spending time in the app. And so here are some of the main advantages of setting up a shopping strategy. For one, you can now turn inspiring content into actionable content. Two, you can own your own brand narrative with the full suite of shopping products. And third, you can create full funnel strategies with Instagram shopping. So you can build out larger brand moments based on the interests of your audience while facilitating transactions all in one place. So to our first point, we know that content drives inspiration and that inspiration drives action. 92% of users says, said they have taken action right in the moment of seeing something on Instagram, like going to a website or purchasing it online. 
And now businesses can help people tap and shop right when they are inspired to do so. And so Paracone MD is a brand that does this really well. Um, you know, I think everybody can maybe experience a little bit of Zoom fatigue. So if you've got your phone with you and you want to pull out uh, your Instagram app and just open it, I can find I find it really helpful to kind of follow along with some of these examples and look at some of these brands because um, the ones that are showcased really are brands that are doing a really successful job at, at building out a commerce strategy. Um, or you can like take notes on a couple of them. But I think that can be like a, a helpful way to like broadly get engaged and, and kind of see what these strategies look like more organically. But as you can see here, what uh, Paracone MD does really well is um, basically taking existing creator and brand content and seamlessly weaving it in uh, to include basically a bunch of different products with shopping tags. And so in the image to the right, you can see that Paracone uses clear call to actions and instructions to help people shop in the moment. And Paracone is also an Instagram checkout seller. So their shoppable content is now an additional e-commerce channel that's situated right where people go to be inspired. We think about owning your own brand story. Businesses are in the driver's seat of owning their brand story. And unlike other e-commerce sites and apps, um, you can shoot your own content, pick your own models and choose the products that you wanna highlight. So whatever you feel like your, your visual voice is, um, it is consistent across Instagram shopping, like on Shep's, where imagery is pulled from your existing product catalog and businesses can create groups of products to tell a story and on product description pages where content is pulled directly from tagged posts. And so Tanya Taylor is a good example of a brand that dictates their story well with shopping. They've utilized shopping tags and stories in a unique way that provides utility, customer reviews. They also highlight members of their community to create shoppable content in a way that's really relevant and engaging, which help builds trust and uh, builds trust and ultimately makes shoppable assets feel more native to the user. And in their shop, they feature looks on models, their own shoppers and creators, so that people can see clothing worn in a bunch of different ways. And overall, Tanya Taylor turns its existing lifestyle at the, whoa. <laughs> it turns its like existing aesthetic into an e-com experience in a way that's really authentic for users. And thirdly, as we think about, um, you know, broadly, uh, different concepts on, on really leveraging uh, Instagram shopping in meaningful ways. Um, businesses can develop entire brand concepts that reach new people and drive instant shopping. It's really one of the superpowers of Instagram. People can have all of the joy of an engaging brand experience, plus they can shop. And it's not just transaction. Think about creating a shoppable moment beyond just, um, you know, the typical shoppable moments. And, and think about creating tent poles or topics that align with your brand and your audience's interests. So Adidas did this really well. They latched on to a large Instagram cultural mo moment during Coachella. They dropped an exclusive product during Coachella to promote their new Adidas Donald Glover collaboration. And it started with an airdrop request to accept a photo from an account claiming to be Donald Glover. Uh, broadly, the boldest festival attendees wel welcomed the picture and were treated to the shoes. And after the stunt, Glover released five videos titled Donald Glover Presents, leveraging his brand equity to increase awareness around the drop. The shoes launched on Instagram with shoppable tags and started selling out within eight hours. So we think about how to get started. We know that there's quite a few shopping features for businesses to tap into. 
And so we created a visual guide on how to help people find your products and how to help products find people. So first, uh, be sure to create and upload your product catalog to Facebook. Then you can go into Commerce Manager and enable your shop. Um, I would say if you're using a website platform like Shopify or a big commerce, uh, it might make sense to see if there's, um, I know that there's connections that are built between uh, some of our larger platforms. So it could be worth going into one of those first to see what those connections look like. Might be a little bit more streamlined to have everything in one place. But if you're not, you can definitely use our commerce manager to enable your shop. Um, and really any products highlighted in your shop can be turned into collections um, and businesses can highlight products in posts with shopping tags uh, and promote any of their content with shopping ads. So you can see here on the left hand side, these are basically everything that becomes available to you when you go ahead and open that shop. And all eligible US businesses and creator accounts can sell directly in app with checkout, uh, which lets people purchase your products directly within the app. And then you get access to some more features. Uh, so businesses can reach more shoppers with checkout enabled by using shopping ads uh, or shopping from creators. So you can use shopping ads in both, but sh shopping ads with checkout allows people to directly check out from one of your ads. Uh, you can create ownable moments with product launches and can use live shopping. So really kind of buckets into three steps, opening up your shop, setting up checkout, and then getting access to some of these more bespoke unique features. Cool. So I want to make sure we've got a little bit of time to go into some creative examples. So um, with our last nine or so minutes, I'm just going to go ahead and jump to some of those. So I'm going to go to this one. So Color Camp is a small business, which is a use at home nail gel brand. And they recently set up their shop on Instagram and are a great creative example of how to translate um, basically their own owned e-commerce experience into an immersive e-commerce experience on Instagram. So Color Camp uses both feed and stories to drive exposure and promotion of their shop. And so in the first two videos here, you can see how Color Camp gives quick tips to show how their products are used in different ways. Color Camp shares strong call to actions and stories, driving users to their shop on Instagram. And to further build their brand story, Color Camp has created a range of seasonal collections within their shop, like Pride Day collections, summer collections, and even a collection and story highlight to celebrate the brand's birthday. Editorializing their shop and promoting it in native ways across stories and in feed make their brand hyper relevant to shoppers on Instagram. And to show another example, everybody, well, not everybody, but a good amount of people know what Outdoor Voices is. I live in Austin, so I definitely know what <laughs> Outdoor Voices is. Um, Outdoor Voices was founded in 2013 by Ty Haney, uh, who's really been a champion of body positivity, um, largely fighting against ageism and creating clothing inspired by and made for their community. OV is truly a reflection of what is happening in the world today. And you can feel it from lingerie brands to swimwear to big retail brands and even makeup industries are embracing all types of women and making actual change. And so we can see that with their commerce strategy. It's pretty clear through their creative that Outdoor Voices has an incredibly empowered community from whom they gain insight, ideas, and talent. They listen to and create for their community, featuring creative that always feels authentic, relevant, and real. And the integration of shopping is nuanced and native and in line with both the brand and the consumer. 
And I think uh, looking at these, you'll notice that none of their assets are hyper-produced or too commercial, um, which isn't to say that's right or wrong, but it is what works for their tone of voice and their community. So we think about some of these broader strategies, um, leaning in and really understanding your brand's point of view is, is important. And so creators drive additional discovery, uh, consideration and purchase of brand products. So they can be leveraged in multiple ways, whether that's through collaborations or cross promotion of existing products. And creators are a truly wonderful way to scale uh, basically your brand shopping experts. So when you're co-creating with creators, uh, potentially consider stories in particular, which might be the key to unlocking shopping, uh, broader shopping content creation. And so when we think about creators, you don't have to think about, um, you know, potentially partnering with like a Cardi B or one of like the most like uh, prominent popular celebrities right now. Um, there are also like local creators that you could really tap into and get familiar with. So there's not a one size fits all strategy. I think the point more broadly is really understanding how the ecosystem is changing with the launch of commerce and understanding like what are some strategies you could deploy to really take advantage of that. Um, and it's a pretty big task to try to understand that. So I think leaning on a partner like Hawk can be a really effective way of, of driving um, you know, a broader strategy as it relates to commerce. So let's see. I'm gonna jump over to wrap things up with a couple shops that we love. Um, like I mentioned, I think it can be really healthy to get some inspiration and take a look at different Instagrams for um, basically accounts that are doing a really good job at this. And so the first is the Tiny Tassel, a bright and cheerful small business whose owner brings her brand story to life with collections that contain a variety of products jewelry, accessories, clothing that's curated into mini collections. The second one here is Spearmint Baby, um, who have created a range of editorial collections uh, like this one for the Trendy Baby that make uh, really good use of copy to bring the products and brand tone to life. And lastly, Slayfire, a biodegradable glitter cosmetics company has created visual consistency in their many collections and they decide to categorize collections by product type. So really, like I said, there's not a one size fits all creative solution for how you want to build out your, uh, build out your shop. But um, I think just taking a look at some brands that are doing it well can be a, a great way to start with some inspiration. Um, and I think we'll continue to see this space largely explode over the next year. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting one to watch. So thank you guys for taking the time today. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen as we get ready to pass it over to Kyle. Here we go. <clears throat> All right, yeah, thank you so much for that. It's a lot of information, but was really helpful. And we have some questions that we'll be saving till the end, but I think that was super helpful. Um, so next, we have Hawk Media's very own VP of paid media, Kyle Harrington, as he covers how to get campaign ready and maximize holiday revenue. Kyle's one of the most seasoned Facebook marketers on the planet and knows his shit. So I highly recommend everyone pay attention because he's taught me a lot. And yeah, this is rare that you get the insights that he has and the massive amounts of money he's managed on Facebook and other social platforms and other media platforms and really knows how to prepare for this. So uh, without further ado, Kyle, please take it away. Yeah. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Uh, thank you, Eric. That is a much nicer introduction than I needed. Um, anybody that knows me. Um, I did prepare a couple of slides here. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and Eric or Morgan, could you let me know if you can see it? Yep, you're good. Okay, cool. Um, so welcome everybody, Morgan, thank you for that great job. Um, she had a really nice thorough presentation. Um, I work with Morgan closely, so I really appreciate that. Um, today, my main goal is to chat through 
Um, holiday campaign preparedness, you know, what is it that you're doing um, leading into your campaigns? Um, what do you still have time to do? What's something to think about for next year, um, you know, or going into the new year? Um, a lot that happens um, leading up to campaigns and even coming out of campaigns. Um, a lot of brands, you know, trying to compete in the space um, during this highly competitive time. Um, also, what are you doing with inventory after? Um, a lot of options. Um, and I want to talk through just a couple of quick um, options that you have in the space and some strategy tactics. Um, first, as Eric mentioned, I'm Kyle. Um, it's nice to meet everybody. Um, I oversee all paid media here at Hawk. I work very closely with Eric um, and Morgan um, on the team. Um, I normally don't wear hats like this, so I apologize. Um, my ears look funny, but it's all right. Um, but I'm excited to be here and just want you guys to see what I look like without a hat on in a more normal picture. Um, you know, really for the um, campaign preparedness where it start is, you know, it's the world that we live in today. Um, COVID is really changing the way we live. We shop and communicate. Um, it's really hitting different pockets of consumers um, in different ways. And it's really making them rely on technology more than ever, um, making them be much more mobile friendly. Um, it's enhancing and expediting sales and promotions specifically, um, which is really one of the biggest things, right? Is um, it's really pushing people that they have more time they're mobile friendly, their users, um, which means that we really have to connect with our consumers um, in the best way possible. That's really what it's about, is how is the brand connecting with the consumer um, during these times that are a bit more difficult for brands to reach consumers. Um, and then the ability to try products before they buy. Um, that's a huge piece without having that in-store and that in-store experience or in-store factor. Um, what are we doing to um, give the consumer the best experience possible um, from a virtual standpoint or from a mobile standpoint. That's a really big piece. And then lastly, um, you need to reach a new demographic. Um, you know, you can't rely on the same foot traffic to stores. You can't rely on the same people to find the brand, find you at the same place at the same time. Um, so really what's gonna push you through the holiday season? Um, expedited sales. I think everyone's pretty much on top of this one these days. Um, I know I saw Black Friday um, in August and I saw Black Friday in September. It seems like every month is having a Black Friday. Um, families are really, you know, more cognizant of their finances and consumers um, are much more sensitive to price these days. Um, and they're really turning to e-com to avoid crowds, to avoid in-store, um, which means brands have to be there. Brands have to be competitive. They have to be competing in the space. Um, price is ultimately what is top of mind for all consumers. Um, for many price sensitive shoppers, um, these mega sales days, as they call them, um, are really what they're waiting for and looking for, right? They have options, they have time. Um, delivery has really made that an option. Um, and not leaving your house has really made this an option for brands. Um, nearly one in three global um, respondents say that they'll wait for products to be on promotion, discount, or sale before purchasing. Um, that's a huge part. A third, of the, the third of the nation is really waiting to say, or the world for that matter, is really waiting to say, hey, I'm going to wait for sale products. Um, so you have to be competitive in the space. Um, you have to have expedited sales. You have to have longer times. Um, and you have to have multiple offers out in the market these days. It's not just kind of the old put your Black Friday out there, put your Cyber Monday, call it a day. Um, there's a lot more opportunity in the market um, for competitors to scoop in and really scoop up different days. Um, it's one of the main factors that um, consumers are looking for these days when um, turning to e-com to shop. Um, sale day shoppers, they're tending to be younger. Um, they're very comfortable going from discovery on mobile all the way to purchase. Um, that's a big factor. Um, who is your demographic that is currently purchasing? Um, knowing that, you know, 92 plus percent of traffic with Facebook is mobile. Um, how are you really competing in that space? Um, and how are you appealing to that demographic that is on their mobile devices at home? Um, I know I'm that guy on the couch. I'm sure Eric is um, at night after I've had dinner scrolling through Facebook and I, I buy stuff. Um, I'm sure Eric does too. He's buying, who knows what he's buying these days. Um, he's buying that microphone that you're seeing him use um, and these hats for us apparently. Um, but, um, you know, I think the other piece of this is that um, mega day shoppers, mega sale day shoppers, um, they're an average, um, averaging about 1.4 times more likely higher spenders compared to people who don't shop during these events. So um, you really want to be cognizant of like the average order value of people during these times and how we're able to appeal to these audiences. Um, meaning that sales days like Black Friday and Cyber Monday are key. They're top of mind for majority of consumers. 
Um, there are really key phrases that are standing out and key terms. So Black Friday in August, Black Friday in September, Black Friday in October, ultimately to the leading up to the real Black Friday coming down the pipeline. Um, you know, you want to be in front of these people's mind um, when they're more likely to spend and shop on mobile. Um, they're also more likely to buy gifts for themselves. That's a really big piece of the puzzle. Um, as technology continues to bring the world closer together, sale events are really a worldwide affair. Um, the shopping season that is traditionally known as Black Friday, Cyber Monday, back in the days of the Macy's world of, um, you know, you're waiting for that night before or Walmart waiting the night before to get one of those five flat screen TVs. Um, it's really different now. Um, you have things like Singles Day, you know, um, November 11th, 1111. You have things like Doubles Days. Um, you know, those are really big markets in Asia that are now coming to the US. Um, Last year, about 54% of holiday um, consumers and spending um, waited for a mega sale event. Um, a lot of that was in Asia and now it's trickling over to the US. You see it in the affiliate market, you see it on Facebook, um, really doubling down on the non-traditional holidays um, that are coming down the pipeline. That's a really big piece. Um, I would say this year, we anticipate a significant global participation um, in events driven by this. I think that that's a huge piece. Um, of your strategy, right? What is pushing a brand forward? How are you competing in the space? And how are you appealing to different demographics and different holidays? Um, it's not enough to participate in just Black Friday or just Cyber Monday. Um, you need double days, doubles day, um, you need singles day. Um, you really need to be in front of the mind of the 43% of the consumers that are ultimately gonna shop on Black Friday, but you're also missing, missing out on the 50 plus percent that's shopping on the other holidays. Um, you know, free shipping day, um, green, green day, all of these ones coming down the pipeline are really where you need to be um, during this time. You know, I guess, what does that really tell us where our campaigns need to be, right? So I think we all understand where these people are spending their time, where they're spending their money, how they're spending their money. I don't think it's a shock to anybody. There's a million holidays out there. Um, heck, there's like National Ice Cream Day these days. Um, you know, I think a big piece of that is like, how are we putting that in the digital space, specifically on Facebook and Instagram? Um, what are we doing to lean into um, some of the tactics that are really going to push the campaigns forward and campaign structure um, and just overall channels, um, how we're using algorithm learnings and automation to really push our campaigns forth at this time? Um, the goal is to tap into automation and machine learnings as much as possible to find the right audience at the right time at the most efficient cost, um, and then really boost liquidity. Um, for anyone who isn't familiar with that term, liquidity is when a campaign budget is allowed to flow along the most efficient route to fulfill your objective. Um, if it's used correctly during the holiday timeframe, and I'll align what that looks like, um, this will really maximize your spend, get the lowest CPMs, the lowest CPCs, and really hit the right target demographic, allowing automation to show the right message to the right person, ultimately um, to conversion. So what that looks like in today's world is um, in the run-up to these sales days, we really need to use liquidity to optimize um, the seasonal campaigns for direct response and connect with shoppers who are most likely to respond to your offers um, as I mentioned prior in some of those prior slides, that would look like high spenders and millennials, right? Those are people who are mobile friendly. Those are people who are in the apps. Those are people who are really spending today's world. Um, signals first, you really need to establish um, a signal strategy for your business and build the foundation um, of performance. So what are you putting out there in the market? How are you establishing those campaigns? Um, what are those signals that you're putting out there as a brand to really push um, the message out there? The second piece of that conversation is now that you have those signals established, what does that audience lo really look like? Who is the most valuable audience that you're allowing um, the machine learning to target at the best outcome? So how are you structuring these campaigns to really push the most valuable? Using CBO, campaign budget optimization, um, pushing the most dollars, getting through that learning phase as quick as possible will really be the most efficient. Um, Usually using the signals that you found to then educate the audience and then using machine learnings to target um, in the most efficient way. Placement liquidity, which would be the next part of this journey, um, is really to max maximize the effectiveness and reach of the campaigns. Um, so you're ensuring that the, your ads appear when your cons consumers are. Um, 
are they in certain audiences? Are they in certain places? Do they have, um, sir, are they in the feeds? Are they in um, the stories? Are they in certain interest targets? Are they lookalikes? Are they retargeting audiences? Um, how are you allowing these audiences within placements um, to optimize towards the best performing? You know, I think, um, you know, things have changed in the digital world over the last few years. Um, so you really have to maximize where your dollars are going, why and when. Um, you do have to release a little bit of control. I do know that um, I am guilty of this myself, of really going in and just kind of finicking with too many campaigns. You know, I think a well-planned out strategy like this um, means that you don't have to do that, right? It means that you can actually maximize um, the Facebook tools to really push your campaigns forward in the best way without having to touch too many levers if you have planned everything out, um, allowing you to enjoy Thanksgiving. I know for the last you know, 10 years, I haven't enjoyed Thanksgiving. I've been on my computer with clients. Um, so I think that this is a really a nice way, you know, knowing that we're moving in a little bit more towards automation and having a well thought out strategy will allow you to enjoy Turkey Day a little bit more. Um, that leads me into budget liquidity, um, budget and resources. Um, where are you removing those restrictions ultimately from the campaigns and budget to be spent? Um, optimizing delivery. I know that um, a lot of us want to spend a certain amount of budget on an exact audience. Um, not most efficient, right? Not, um, not the most efficient way to spend your dollar. Um, really allowing the algorithm to show um, the creative on the most efficient placement to the most efficient person at the most efficient cost is really what's going to maximize your budget to drive ultimate sales. And that's the goal. That's, I think we always have to look back at what's our goal. Um, our goal is to not hammer an audience with frequency, but our goal is to be as efficient as we can with our dollars to compete in the space. Um, especially when we're seeing a 30% increase um, in CPMs and CPCs during this time on average. Um, I know across Hawk, we've seen quite a lift in some CPMs and CPCs over the election and going into Q4. Um, when you throw in learning phase, um, you're just, you know, you're, you're dying on those CPMs. So I think that, you know, removing as many restrictions as possible with the budget is really where is key. Or it's key, not is key. Um, the net last piece would be just to simplify the account. I think that that's a really big piece. Um, we can overcomplicate accounts and we can um, make the structure so that it's not able to learn um, from all these pieces. So it's not able to learn from the audience. It's not able to learn from placements. It's not able to learn from the budget. Um, so really having account structure to increase the campaign performance through the automation and liquidity. Um, learning how liquidity and automation can save time, help make your digital campaigns more effective and propel them through basically the purchase cycle, which is the ultimate goal. Um, I do mean that wholeheartedly. I mean it that you really need to simplify. Um, you know, I think the days of having, you know, 25 campaigns all broken out by placements, you know, those days are kind of an archaic way of buying media, specifically on social and in Facebook um, and Instagram, uh, really making the most of the AI tools to push it forward as much as possible. Um, and I really think with this campaign structure, um, the next part of that is you need to be cognizant of who is out there purchasing your um, purchasing, number one, your brand, and number two, how are you reaching a new demographic? I think that that's a key piece that team members miss um, when defining your audience, right? I think we can get stuck in that, hey, I'm 18 to 35, I'm only going to go after younger people because they're mobile friendly. Um, it's a large miss these days and holidays. Um, I think reaching a new demographic is huge. Um, in today's world. Um, it's especially true of Gen X and boomers. I think it's a forgotten demographic in the social space specifically. Um, I know that I um, look at campaigns daily, weekly. Um, I look at that 55 plus category, 45 plus. Um, I know I look like I'm in that category. I'm not for all of you out there. I'm a lot younger than this demographic, um, but I, um, I think it's a big miss on the part. Um, and the reason being is these are the, these are the people, the Gen X and boomers, um, who are becoming more mobile friendly. They're becoming more of um, an e-com play for a lot of people. They also have the most money out there. Um, traditionally, the people in these older demographics have a lot more to spend. Um, among these surveyed, about 72% of Gen X and 50% of boomers say that they're spending more time on mobile during the COVID outbreak. It makes sense, right? Um, all of these people are kind of homebound. Um, they really need um, to purchase. I know a lot of people are having their groceries delivered. A lot of people are, um, you know, delivering for their parents using Postmates, DoorDash. Um, I have a neighbor who is 
using one of the delivery apps for Target, you know, for just like her holiday decorations. She doesn't want to go out. Um, I, that's really having an impact on this market becoming more mobile friendly and your brand needs to be there. Um, boomers are really shopping online. Um, and about 80% of Gen X and boomers are shopping online now. That's a big increase from year over year, if you look at that. Um, digital adoption has really been hard with this demographic, and I think we're all aware of that, which is kind of goes back to simplifying your message um, and simplifying your campaign structure to then meet this. Um, but COVID has really accelerated that these days. That's a piece that's particularly encouraging older demographics and generations to embrace e-commerce. Um, since they've been indoors. And I think that that's a really big piece to think about is, you know, is that a miss in your demographic that you're hitting such a high, um, a high valued audience because you're not willing to be um, in front of them or you're not optimizing your campaigns properly. Um, setting your campaigns up for success means that you'll be hitting a demographic that is new, um, does have money, is spending time indoors and is most likely to convert um, at the end of the year. Um, Globally, mobile purchases um, by these groups during the holiday season has grown um, by average 50% year over year, while 30% have also messaged businesses. So they're really using that messaging app. Um, this is a demographic that is actually asking questions. They're inquisitive. Um, so it's really more important now than ever to make your communication as easy as possible for a, um, this demographic um, and really make a connection with your consumer, um, which leads me to my next piece is, um, you know, chatbots. I think we all forget that chatbots exist and it is a type of marketing. I think that some people think it just happens. Well, it doesn't. Um, you know, the first piece of this is having a site to connect with your brand and uh, to connect um, with the consumer with the best experience possible um, with the most streamlined user experience. Um, connecting to a consumer um, to drive conversions takes the personalization of the consumer's journey along every step of the way with mobile messaging, meaning, you know, you're able to customize the experience the person has and their journey. You're able to answer questions like you would in a store. Um, you're able to ultimately make a conversion um, happen while it might be a little bit longer process. It streamlines the idea that someone has the ease, um, specifically in that older demographic too, to ask questions about a new brand. I know that I um, have a hard time finding jeans as an example. I am tall and lanky. Um, for anyone that doesn't know, I'm 6'4". Finding jeans that are hard for me, um, you know, is hard. I can't need a little longer inseam. Um, I use chatbots for that. Hey, what's the inseam? on jeans. Um, it's definitely an interesting demographic. Um, it's another thing with furniture. Um, a lot of times furniture descriptions on sites, it's an interesting piece. We work on quite a few brands here at Hawk, um, home decor brands and furniture brands. Um, they don't have all the dimensions properly. So and having a chat bot that can answer it like that, like what's the dimension? What's the circumference? What's the height? Um, that really helps with mobile shopping these days. Um, it really allows you to connect with your consumer um, but on the other side of this, it allows you to um, collect consumer data. It allows you to connect their um, email, allows you to get their phone number. Um, it allows you to get insights about your products. So while chatbots are great for the personalization of the consumer journey, for the brand, they're even more valuable. Um, you're seeing what questions people are asking of how you can tailor your site experience. That's a huge piece, right? If a furniture brand is missing the height um, of a table or the um, inseam of a jean like I used on myself, um, the example, um, it's really great that you can have that insight for people to add that to their site, um, easing the consumer journey, I guess is the point. The next side of that is what products are people questioning? Why are they questioning them? Um, you know, how are you using these educational learnings to then push your conversion rate um, on your site um, much faster? The last piece is, is there something missing? You know, um, is there something missing from your site that you're not aware of that people are asking? Um, is there a step in the journey that people are getting confused on and caught up that's ultimately hindering and hurting your conversion rate? Um, and you're doing all of this while collecting their email so you can build remarketing audiences. Um, you're doing all of this while collecting um, prospecting audiences, making lookalike audiences. Um, you're also collecting knowledge for other parts of your business. So I think it's really important to not um, derail the value of something like this, and especially with the cost. It's not a super expensive um, piece of your business, given the conversions that you do on mobile um, these days. So the first piece of this would be you really need to plan where the conversion um, can happen and where the support tool is needed. Um, you know, working with partners is a great place. So obviously this would be something in Facebook Messenger, um, the Facebook Messenger app, WhatsApp, um, even just on the desktop site itself, you know, having that little pop-up, 
great, um, great uh, tools to use. Second is working with a partner to create this, something like um, a Facebook marketing partner, um, like an Octane AI. Um, there's quite a few out there you can use. We partner at Hawk with Hawk, Octane AI. Um, they have a really nice quiz feature. They're a Facebook marketing partner, um, a Shopify partner as well. Um, but um, they have a really nice quiz feature where you can actually ask and, and be inquisitive about a certain product that works really, really nicely with the Facebook platform. Um, it enables you to, again, kind of going back to my point, collect data up front. Um, that'll inform your future business decisions. That's really a big piece of it. Um, and it also takes the heavy lifting off of you, another really great piece of that. Um, third is you really want to reach your consumers. Um, you really want to drive awareness about this. This is a tool for your consumer. It customizes the journey. It um, connects them to your brand. And it's a really personalized experience. And I think that that's something that a lot of consumers are looking for in today's world. Um, you know, that how are you connecting with your brand? I know that um, I actually like to shop in a store. Um, a lot of you probably think that's insane. Um, I like to go actually meet a salesperson. I like to buy jeans and try them on. Um, not the world we're living in today, right? Not a lot of people are comfortable with that, um, especially that older demographic that was on the previous slide. Um, so you really need to make sure that you're connecting with these people. Um, what that looks like is you need to test messaging. You need to test experience. You need to test value props. Um, and this is really a great way for you to understand how it's really pushing your business forward. Um, you know, the text messaging experience is great, um, but how are you connecting on the platforms that people are, have questions about products? Um, really making that emotional connection that someone feels like you're there to push their brand forward. Um, I think that this is a forgotten tactic in the social space that it's an additional layer that you need to be cognizant of. You know, running ads is not building a connection with somebody. Um, running ads is a tool to build the connection. Um, so you really need to appeal to somebody creatively, but then you need to have that personalization aspect. Um, lastly, you really want to expand once you've tested. So once you've tested things um, and different types of messaging and experiences, um, an example for holiday would be something like a gift guide, um, seasonal um, combinations. I know that that's a fun one. Um, testing value props, um, free returns and exchanges, policies, 10% off your first purchase, 20% off code if they've added a cart. Um, you know, what's really getting people to um, convert? And then lastly, you just want to iterate on this and expand. So you want to try out new products, new experiences, new value props. Um, use the data that you've had to really make this as a growth opportunity. Um, it, are these remarketing audiences that you're building um, pushing your campaigns forward? Are these added to cart audiences pushing your campaigns forward? Um, you know, what's really pushing these people forward ultimately at the end of the day? I think that that's a big piece of the question um, out there. And then um, personalization is really a must going into holiday. So, um, you know, while messaging is a quick and convenient in the moment conversation, um, there's other types of messaging out there. And I just wanted to explore um, one last type of messaging with you. Um, but this, is, this can be something that you can do pretty quickly um, and have a meaningful result. The next piece is trying before you buy. Um, you know, lastly, talking about person, personalization, um, a highly overlooked piece in the social space is augmented reality. I wanted to push the buttons here a little bit and kind of get us to think outside the box um, in kind of my last talking point here. Um, I wanted us to think about something a little bit differently. So I wanted us to think about the idea of seeing an ad. Um, the idea of seeing an ad um, like this Ray-Ban, I buy Ray-Bans, um, I like Ray-Bans, I'm sure um, Everyone here has had a pair of Ray-Bans at some point. Um, I know when I was in high school, I was buying fake Ray-Bans, but um, it's interesting, right? You see an ad, it appeals to you. It's a brand you know. Um, how do you know if that size fits your face? So the idea of having the shoppable um, that Morgan was talking about, the shoppable link, um, you click into it, right? It's kind of interesting. Um, you click into it, you see the pair of um, Wayfarers, the black classic Wayfarer. Um, the piece that I'm missing here is there's different sizes, right? Different millimeters. Um, how do you know um, if that looks good on your face? I don't know. I have a big head. Um, I have weird eyes. I got a big head. I got a weird nose. Um, does it look good on me? Probably not. Um, it'll probably look good on all of you. But the piece missing there is how do you know if this is going to fit your face? How do you know if you need um, a 52 millimeter or 54 millimeter? How do you know if you like the squared or the rounded edges? Um, it's interesting. Augmented reality is really a piece where you can try it out. 
Um, this is something that's really interesting um, on Instagram as this example, um, that it's an environment where you can take a real world environment, making it a augmented reality experience and making it viewable in an environment in which users are aware of their surroundings and themselves and forming an even larger connection with the brand. Um, AR shopping experiences um, receive approximately a 65 to 69% higher conversion rate within social apps. Um, that's tested in a lot of places. Um, one thing, I'm using a sunglasses example. Um, I've seen quite a few examples of people not wanting to leave their homes recently in the furniture space. You can actually take a picture of your space and implement a chair in the space. Like this gentleman here has um, you know, the sunglasses on. Um, do they look good on his face? Um, the other side of that, does a chair look good in your home? Does a plant look good in your home? Um, I know this is something that we're looking to test with a few of our um, home decor partners. Um, we've actually seen it um, work in some of the high-end spaces really, really nicely. The older demographic isn't looking to leave their house. They're really looking to engage um, with their consumer and ultimately increase those conversion rates because when you can envision something in your home, in your space, on your body, you've ultimately made that connection that you would make if you were in a store. So um, this augmented reality connection of the try before you buy methodology is really interesting. Um, it's something that while it can be expensive, there's ways to make it with partners, um, with Facebook marketing partners, really affordable for brands. Um, you can really have the customers engage with the brand and products via digital experiences, allow them to try it on, try it out, um, interact with it, personalize the product to them, try different colors. You can see on the bottom of that. Um, the Is that him or me? What? Oh, um, sorry, Eric, I thought you jumped on. Um, I thought that, um, you know, the other piece of that is um, you can interact and personalize the product um, with these experiences by trying new colors, by trying new things out, um, you know, really ultimately um, checking out. Um, it is possible to check out um, with these products too. It's a really interesting way um, to move forward, but um, you can try different colors, try different sizes. I apologize, um, I got off my train of thought there. Um, but it's a really nice way to use your experience. Um, it really also enhances and expedites the sales and promotions of products um, that you're connecting with consumers. So another piece to think about is if someone is in a store and they're trying something on and there's a promo and they like it, they're gonna buy it right then. So I think another piece of this is adding on a layer of promo and adding on a layer of expedited sales to this will ultimately make people accountable um, or make people purchase in an expedited manner because they fall in love with the product, they form a connection with it. Um, the ability to allow consumers to try products before um, they buy and ultimately reaching a new demographic um, and pushing through the holiday season, I think is the main goal. So with that said, um, I think that that's pretty much it that I had. Um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, and Eric, I can pass it back to you. Like well done, back. Kyle. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> no, you're good. <laughs> I, of course, my internet goes out right as you're wrapping up, but here we are. No, you're good. <laughs> cool. So yeah, so I am now going to jump in with about 15 minutes of some just overall concepts, market updates, that kind of thing, guys, and then we'll get into Q&A. So 10 to 15 minutes of, yes, just what's going on in the world around Facebook, because I think it's important, like having the detail and the... Um, the sort, yeah, the detail around Facebook and how to leverage it, how to leverage chatbots, all of the things that were talked about today, but also how it fits into the ecosystem. And so some stats to understand this year that are super important. In Q2 of this year, really due to COVID, um, the uh, average consumer mix of spending online versus in, in e-commerce versus in store went from 13% to 30%. So assuming not a huge drop in consumer spending, which the only drops we really saw were on uh, travel, leisure, hospitality, not on consumer goods. Uh, so the basically over 2 x the ability to earn online. And we saw this with a lot of brands. We saw a lot of brands skyrocket during that period. A lot of our investments, a lot of our clients saw a 2 x or more increase in revenue. I've seen as high as 5x during Q2 literally that three month period. And we're not talking about 
a business doing $50,000 a month or $20,000 a month. We had clients that are doing a million a month went to 4 million, like big, big jumps that happened. Um, and so there's a few things that you need to understand with that. One, because people were stuck at home, digital consumption of content went up about 70% meaning people were on Facebook, on Instagram, on all these platforms about 70% more time than they were prior to Q2. And so all these things obviously dictated the e-commerce industry basically doubling in the second quarter of this year. If you look at it, Shopify's revenue as a great indicator went up 96% in the second quarter of this year. So that, that was the big rush that forced this to be, you know, it went from e-commerce and sort of the consumer spending space. Again, it was 13% of consumer purchases. So for bigger brands, it was like, you know, this is important to have, but it's not the big driver of the business to now it's 30%. This is a big driver of the business and it's a much more profitable channel. It's a lot, there's a lot more control there. And so it's, it's really accelerated the e-commerce industry five to 10 years. And so Facebook has obviously benefited from that. What's really interesting about how Facebook worked during this time, and it's, it's been a very long seven months since we were all quarantined, but to kind of recap, first off, everybody was worried that, you know, marketing spends go back during, you know, a recession, during a crisis, people pull their marketing. It's the first thing people cut. I've heard it as an agency owner for the seven years I've owned this, that when a, whenever a recession comes, that's going to be the first thing that pulls back. That was very true prior to digital. In the last recession, when, you know, in the last recession, yeah, Facebook ads didn't even exist yet. Everybody cut their marketing as soon as things got uh, unstable. The reason for that is also like consumer spending online at that point wasn't 13%. I don't know the actual number, but let's assume it was two, three. It wasn't a very high number back in 2008. And so brick and mortar can survive without marketing. You, it's still marketing is a way to compete. It's not a way to drive foot traffic. People are still walking down the street at that point. People are still going into stores. You're still going to sell products if you cut off marketing. What changed in the past decade is now marketing is actually how you get your traffic, how you get people to actually see that you exist and continue to come back. And without it, it's also very easy to steal that traffic. It's, you know, in a weird metaphor, imagine that the road changes every day depending on where someone's spending. So if your streets all of a sudden revert to another store because they spent more, you can't just rely on foot traffic because someone's pushing the road the other direction. And so it kind of it forced companies that were aware of that to continue to spend. And so there was a lot of predictions around Facebook getting hit very hard in Q2. And then Q3 came around and there was a lot of politi politicalization around spending money on Facebook and a bunch of the big brands claimed they pulled out. The, the ironic thing is the massive CPG companies and the larger automotive companies and the big travel companies, a lot of the big spenders on Facebook pulled out in March because these big companies, they can't move quickly and they, they, they need to cut fast because they can't wait for things to play out. They don't have the ability to see what is actually happening. They need to make quick decisions to maximize profitability, which is also why you saw some digital companies and technology companies doing layoffs in Q2, which by the way, as we've seen the industry skyrocketed, but still people were laying off because they have to move fast. They have to get ahead of it and try to predict where the ball is going, not wait till they have data. The benefit of being a small and medium business is you can wait for that data. And what we saw as an agency are the people that waited started to see very quickly that a few things happened. One, as mentioned, the consumer spending went all online. So all of a sudden, there was way more revenue to capture with online marketing. Number two, all the big brands pulled out of Facebook, which actually drove the cost to advertise on Facebook for Q2 down about 30%. So you have way more market to grab and a lower cost to advertise again, ends up equaling a skyrocketing business if you stuck with it. And so what we learned from that is, again, sticking with it in a crisis, really attacking at it and really watching the data was the way to, to respond to this and to react to this. And so now what we're seeing is it, it, the past month and a half has been very tough because a couple of things happened. One, people think Q2 was the start of a trend. And you have to be logical about this and not blindly optimistic as a lot of CEOs, including myself can be, where that trend, just want to make sure I'm still there because Kyle's frozen on my screen. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear perfect. you. Perfect. Baron just commented it's so perfect. All right. So yeah, <laughs> stay on offense is exactly the, the term that we heard from, frankly, Anthony Scaramucci, but it was exactly 
what we wanted to do. And that was, by the way, April 7th, when things, you know, shit was hitting the fan, we kept hearing stay on offense. And that's good until, but you also need to realize that, again, you have to keep watching the data because what ended up happening now in Q2 and going, or sorry, Q3 going into Q4, a few things. One, people thought that, well, if I grew 400% in Q2, maybe I'll grow another 400% in Q3. Like this is a trend line. And they took two data points and started a trend. That's very risky because what we've seen now is consumer spending in Q3 went from 30% market share online to 27%, which makes sense. People are actually going outside again. They're able to go to the store. They're going to start buying at the store again. What I don't believe is it's going back to 13 or 14. Like it's going to stay above 20, maybe even 25, um, but it's not going to be up at 30. It'll probably trend back that way over time. But there was a very unnatural acceleration of purchasing online that people still like to go to their local supermarket to buy their food and didn't for a little while. A lot of people didn't. So you're going to see that trend subside a little bit, along with some of the bigger brands that pulled out of advertising are now back into it, along with two very big things that happened late Q3 and Q4, holiday season, which means everybody's going to start spending more, and which is a lot of what we talked about today, and the election. And a lot of people have missed this, but about 50%, no, sorry, 33% of on digital advertising right now is going towards politics in the election. Facebook has toned this down a lot, but it still exists on Facebook. But in general, you're dealing with a lot of competition with people trying to pass legislation right now, trying to get elected, and that ends next week. So we're seeing a lot of people that are, frank, you know, being not understanding the broader picture, which is what I'm here to talk about and super important, pulling back on marketing and not understanding that a lot of the reason that things are way more expensive, I mean, could be a third more expensive is because of politics, which ends Tuesday, hopefully. So though that in the advertising budgets will end Tuesday. So you're not going to see those ads. You're not going to have the same spend, but the past month has been insane and it's a competitive landscape. So it's going to drive your costs up. So it's hyper, hyper important to understand a few things. One, do not use Q2 as a trend. Be optimistic. That's fine. But we've seen clients overorder product, over uh, project. And you have to be really careful on doing that in your companies too. Uh, number two, understand uh, you want to run the opposite direction. When everyone's pulling out of Facebook, it's a good time to spend on Facebook. And in holiday season, using a lot of the strategies that were mentioned today are really important. But one thing that we've done year after year and encourage people to do that always feels counterintuitive is to actually spend heavy as well in Q3. So thinking, hopefully all of your businesses are growing and doing well, and next year you have time to do the, implement this strategy. But in Q3, it's really important to build top of the funnel because everyone else isn't. June, July, August are terrible, terrible months. And I know June is not Q3, just to be clear. But June, July, August are terrible months for retail. Online, people you know, in a normal year are going on summer breaks. They're traveling. They're not paying attention. They're not shopping as much. And so we usually see, they, we always see dips with like, gift driven and lifestyle driven products. If you're not an exception dips in June, July, and January, they call it the J months. They're hard in fashion, specifically beauty. Those are hard months. And what people do when they're being short sighted about strategy is they pull back in those months. But here's the key difference. What, what isn't happening is purchases, but what you're paying for with Facebook are impressions or clicks are new leads. And so what we've seen over time is again, the competition gets slimmer during the you know, summer months. And so if you spend more, you're going to generate a ton of email addresses. You might not see a direct ROI that month in sales, but thinking about marketing from a month to month, week by week basis is a great way to never succeed because it doesn't work that way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this in a sec, but if you can build that lead source, you can get in with your potential customers during the summer months. When by the time you hit this time period, these holiday seasons where everyone's wearing, you know, Hawk Media Santa hats, you actually have the ability to double down on your retargeting, on your chatbots, on your email marketing, and you get a much bigger jump in ROI. It makes you much more competitive. And we've had a few opportunities with clients that have bought in on this, and it's worked every time. And it it is definitely, as a small business, hard to swallow because your returns during the summer are not going to be as good and it feels like you're wasting money. But when you think about you're still capturing those email addresses, you start measuring it for more your audience in that top of the funnel and middle of the funnel, not just bottom of the funnel and closing people, you end up being able to benefit from that later. And you end up not having to spend during it as much during a time when everyone is spending a lot of money, which is Q4. This year and every four years specifically during election season is crazy won't be the same next year, but it's still more expensive. Doesn't mean you shouldn't spend because you also convert at a higher rate. You want to grab people during the time when they're making buying decisions too, but it's a good balance. Um, 
And so uh, the last little bit of note I want to talk about is understanding that purchase cycle or that consideration period. And mo it's the most common thing I see people glaze over and see people miss, which is most people look at their marketing on a day by day, week by week, month by month basis. And they look at Excel files going like, okay, so we spent $10,000. How much did we make? And the problem with looking at it that way is you have to understand that there's a period between when you when someone receives an ad and when they actually buy called a consideration period or a purchase cycle. And so when your Facebook is super important, that's why Facebook allows for a 28 day tracking pixel, but it should actually, and it sometimes be expanded off that. So what we've seen statistically is if you have a fit and it's tied to order value it most directly. So if you have a $50 average order value, the average we've seen is about three week purchase cycle or consideration period. That means it's three weeks from when someone first sees an ad to on average when they buy. For $100, it's five weeks. For $200, it's six weeks. And it trails off after that. Between two and three months, you're going to have any type of impulse buy or discovery uh, buy where they're learning about something new, which Facebook is the best platform for that. Facebook and Instagram is the, absolutely the best way to help customers discover you. But when, you're no, when you know you're fighting for discovery, know that outside of holiday season, which has a little you know, different characteristics, a standard purchase cycle can be three weeks to three months, which means you have to set up your funnel that way to maximize what you're doing on Facebook. We do this through email automation, SMS marketing is hyper valuable, creating content to keep engaging people above and beyond a purchase decision. So great branded content. Um, what, you know, my favorite example of this is Red Bull. Like the guy jumping out of space has nothing to do with Red Bull, but it gets my attention. I'm now engaged. And now when I think about buying an energy drink, it's going to be Red Bull. So thinking about ways to engage your audience and keep them in the fold for both during that purchase cycle to, to two things. One, accelerate it as well as increase your close rate. Because if you keep people engaged, you keep building that trust and that relationship, they're going to have a higher efficacy. And also giving them content allows them to share it with other people to increase your word of mouth. So as you buy one customer on Facebook, let's say, and I use the word buy, like you're spending money on Facebook, you get a customer. If you can actually incentivize that K factor in word of mouth, it allows them to then go and recruit other people. And so for every cost for acquiring a customer on Facebook, if I get three more because they're telling friends, I just quadrupled my ROI on my Facebook ads. So that's another piece. And then also lifetime value, which by the way, is way more important than your first purchase. You need to understand with your business, are people buying on an ongoing basis? Because then it'll allow you to scale Facebook in a more meaningful way because you're looking at, you know, maybe you make $25 the first time they buy, but maybe they buy every month. And so by the end of the year, you're at $300. And so, you know, you might spend $30 to acquire a customer. Well, if you are calculating that you only made 25, that feels like a loss. I'm losing money every time I get a customer. This sucks. But if you know that confidently on average, you're going to get $300 for every one of those $30 customers in the first year, now it's something you want to spend a ton on. So be very careful how you look at your numbers. Make sure to maximize that LTV. Again, super important to drive lifetime value of a customer. Understand these trends and really watch the data as right now in a, in a crisis, and I'm going to use the word crisis, like what is happening with COVID and the election and everything, things change very volatilely. And that means don't try to anticipate, but watch the data closely because you all have the benefit of making quick decisions and make those quick decisions based on data, based on numbers, and understand that those that data and those numbers need to be clean. They need to be the right data, the right numbers, meaning when you're looking at your returns on Facebook, as an example, you need to look over the, the standard consideration period or purchase cycle of your customer, because then you can get an idea for what is called the half-life or half of the returns you're going to get from those ads. So if you have a two-month average uh, purchase cycle, Facebook itself won't even tell you that data. So you actually have to have other tools that you can use to see what the returns are on those leads you're getting from Facebook. But we've watched a lot of companies succeed heavily with this, and a lot of companies not take this advice and frankly, cut off their nose to spite their face because they think based on the data, they're failing when they actually are succeeding. So make sure to uh, stay on top of the stuff. Holidays, guys, again, after Tuesday next week, you should all see a bump in, uh, or I guess a drop in cost on Facebook and a lot of these other channels. Uh, I think a lot of the, I think people are going to calm down when they realize no matter who wins, the world's not going to end. And that's personal opinion, but I'm going to throw it out there. And uh, I think you're, uh, you're going to see a lot of success in the holidays because people you know, as it gets colder, we're seeing surges in the virus. We're seeing people stay at home. So sitting here, knowing that you're all advertising on Facebook and running e-commerce, like you're going to do well with this. So thank you all. And uh, yeah, with that, we want to open it up to questions. 
Let's do it. Let's do it. Did you already answer one or did one get deleted? Oh, I got kicked out. That's what it was. So there might, you guys might see the question. <laughs> there was one in the Q&A section and feel free to fill out the q and I'll also jump into Slack too. In the Slack Facebook channel, if you guys are in Brand Club. And I've got a few that were submitted as well that I can start. So first question, we'll just go to the group. Um, any insight on recent or upcoming changes to special ad category audiences and campaigns? Yeah, I'll probably speak to this one. Um, Kyle, you and I, we can probably go back and forth based on our areas of expertise. Um, there will be some changes that are coming for February 2021. I wouldn't say you can expect anything heading into Q4. Um, broadly, special ad audience or special ad categories are focused around um, our housing, employment, and credit advertisers. And the, these policies were implemented um, for those that don't know, um, in line with our anti-discrimination like anti-discrimination policies. So like they're broadly not going to revert. I don't know if that's what the question is is getting at, but <clears throat> the changes that I see coming down the line um, will likely ensure that you can't really get around um, anti-discrimination policies in place. So hopefully that answers it. Perfect. I like the questions in chat. So I'll go back and forth, but is it ever too early to start your Q4 marketing? I'll start with you guys and I'll get my answer. Kyle says no. Quick answer. I would say no. I would say no. The cheaper the traffic, the better. Building those remarketing uh, funnels um, is a really big piece there. Um, I also don't think it's um, too early to start other tactics like the chat bot, like getting thinking ahead of other um, other out there. Like augmented reality takes a little bit of time. Um, so I think really thinking ahead. Um, I would even start in May. I mean, like, what is your goal? How are you going to achieve it? And um, how are you going to make the most? Um, I would say. This is a perfect month. Um, as an example, um, CPMs are up 30%. You could have bought that same traffic, 30% more traffic at the same price a month and a half ago, and then been able to retarget those consumers just with a longer consideration period. Um, I guess the question is, why would you not start earlier? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the, the the distinction there is, okay, so with holiday, always be preparing for it. Like I think if you aren't thinking about holiday for next year and how you're gonna lead into it in a full annual strategy, I think is a mistake, but in terms of creative, when do you think it's too early to wear Santa hats and get on a webinar? <laughs> Never. Um, Never. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a concept called holiday in July where advertisers really start planning for holiday in July. Um, and, and what they start doing to kind of demystify that is preparing for these really massive spend days like Black Friday over um, kind of seasonal moments. So like Prime Day. And so if you go through the run once, you're a little bit more prepared for the run through again on like your biggest spend day. Um, yeah. So I would say people are preparing as early as July. And last point there is um, I think shipping is going to be really interesting this year, especially uh -huh. as we head in, um, you know, to the holidays. So I would expect people are going to do most of their Christmas shopping if they're planners, which I am. So I might be biased, but um, earlier. So I, I would say it, it probably is going to like purchases will probably happen earlier. Yeah, makes sense. So this is a good question because I actually don't, I think I know the answer to this, but I think it's worth asking. Can you move your Yelp reviews over to Facebook? Because uh, Sherry has a client with 600 five-star reviews and wants to, on Yelp, but wants to see if they can port to Facebook in some way. I don't know off the top of my head. We can follow up with that one. Perfect. Um, all right, Logan, in Facebook advertising, would you recommend at a high level keeping up your prospecting audience during the week of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, so you can prospect for Q1 or move most of your money to remarketing as we would expect uh, more traffic during this time? Yeah, I would say um, I can jump in there. I would say um, there's two sides to that, right? Is one, you want to capitalize on the audience that's most likely to convert, which is obviously someone who's heard of your brand. Um, the other side of that is you want to tap into a demographic who has never heard of your brand who might give you a shot. Um, so I would say that while we would shift heavily, I think that you should not neglect that prospecting audience, knowing that someone's more likely to give a product a shot on a discount or deal. Um, so two sides of that coin, I guess, Morgan, would you agree? <laughs> totally. Um, and I think brands are, or people are becoming more comfortable buying from brands they've never bought from before. Um, so rather than, oh, I, you know, I just want to buy from a Nordstrom or something, they'll, they'll go and actually convert on those prospecting audiences more and more. So um, 
the thing I would say as it relates on that front is just, um, you know, with your net new customers that you're driving from a prospecting standpoint, like really double down on a great customer experience. Um, yeah. Cause as Eric was saying around lifetime value, you don't want to spend a bunch of money to get a new customer for them only to ever buy from you one time, like give them a seller experience. Um, and, and I think they'll come back for more. All right. How will audio apps like clubhouse benefit advertisers? Um, I like that because Clubhouse, it's like, do you guys, are you familiar with Clubhouse, Morgan or Kyle? I'm actually not. You are Kyle? Cool. So it's yeah. basically, it was launched during COVID. It's, it's like a speech social network where you would always just like get on panels and talk to each other. It is cool. Um, I think they're going to limit advertising. Um, I don't, I'm curious how they end up monetizing it, but they've really tried to make it like a, like exclusive club more than anything, hence the name. So I don't know that that's going to be good for advertisers. I think it's really interesting for networking. I think it's really interesting for brand awareness, but I don't think you're going to just start running ads on Clubhouse. I, I'd be surprised if that came anytime soon. All right, question for you, Morgan. Uh, you talked about commerce across Facebook platforms, including Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Do you have any perspective about whether when the Quest platform will be added to the Facebook commerce ecosystem? Good question. That is a good question. Um, I would say broadly, no. Um, we typically build our ads products um, in line with like consumer, consumer behavior. So I think as we see consumer behavior on Quest increase, then you could potentially expect those two things to be integrated. Um, broadly speaking, Oculus is probably like the one thing that's pulled out from the rest of our um, like social apps. So uh, it's a great question, um, but not yet. And so I have actually a question that came up as you were speaking um, that you hinted at, which is you were saying consumers are more comfortable buying from companies they don't recognize that trust is getting a little less important because they, they are just comfortable. I've also seen the opposite where there's a lot of, frankly, Chinese companies putting great ads up and selling crap that doesn't show up for six months. I was, I bought a pair of sunglasses that took six months to show up and they blamed customs, even though I had other things coming from China that got here fine. And, uh, I've heard a lot, I've seen a lot of stories on Instagram, like friends and stuff buying like this really cool product. And then it gets there and like, this is actually a really tangent, but st story. Someone bought like a light, a cloud that was like a light where it's like a bunch of lights inside of, you know, what looked like, you know, a big cloud that looked like a storm cloud in the corner of your room, really cool imagery. And then they get it and it's like two wads of cotton and a flashlight like actually happened. So there's a lot of people running those on Instagram and Facebook. And I guess aside from waiting for all the bad reviews to uh, roll in when they've done a bad job like that, how are you guys combating that? Is there something happening there? Yeah, there's a lot of work that's happening there. So um, it's really based on our customer feedback. So after people purchase a product online, um, they get a survey to basically tell Facebook, how was your experience? And you can rate it from one to five. Yeah. And advertisers who fall below a certain threshold will not be able to advertise on the platform again. Yeah. And so that's essentially how we're trying to build trust in the ecosystem. Because to your point, why do you really want to buy something off of a Facebook or Instagram ad again if you're going to get a couple pieces of cotton and a light bulb? Yeah. And on that note, because it's something Kyle and I have actually been talking about recently, I've seen a pretty large spike in Facebook banning people, which in, in, you know, sometimes rolling it back, but it, it came up when I posted about this, someone commented they were banned for five days and then it rolled back. Is there like a public new policy that they've put in place to try to police what's advertising on Facebook much more stringently? Or is it just, is it anecdotal or is there actually something happening that Facebook's gotten more strict? I think it's a combination of a lot of things. So mm -hmm. one of them being a lot of our workforce is not um, able to do their jobs fully right now because of COVID. Yep. And so like the uh, sanctity of our systems is just tried by less employees being able to like be there and do their job. Um, there's going to just be increasing improvements in our system. So uh, machine learning, like as a system learns, it improves over time. Doesn't mean that all, all of them are right, but we'll likely see more enforcements because of more learning as the system is able to detect more potential, I would guess like circumventing activity would probably be the best way to describe it. Um, but we hear you. I mean, I've been in close contact with you guys a lot more than, than normal. So um, that would, a little bit of context, that's probably what's going on, um, but nothing like, 
no hard lines to share. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, yeah, it was just interesting because it's it's one of those things that like didn't come up often at all until two months ago, and all of a sudden, I was wondering if there was political pressure or something. Because as mentioned in comments, and anti-Semitism is finally off Facebook, which agree with, but at the same time, is interesting how other brands are getting looped into that. But that makes sense that it's also a staffing thing. Um, yeah, it's being recorded. We're gonna share all of this as well, Michelle. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I want to make sure we answer all the people that are here because I can go into some of the ones that were submitted. And it looks like you, you get a hold of Kyle. You can, um, my email is just kharrington at Huff Media, um, but I can definitely send that out after too. So something that came up, what does an individual brand do to get a hold of a Facebook representative? I know this is a common challenge for people. A lot of them come to us. What What is, was the strategy there? Um. Largely speaking, there's not really an intake form right now. Um, as I mentioned before, there are 9 million advertisers on the platform. And so from just like a staffing perspective, um, I'm not the one that's making these decisions, but the decisions are being made more broadly around like, how can we if, like effectively support the larger network? I, I think it's something that our teams are looking at more, um, especially as like, you know, you're running into broader challenges around policy, getting advertising restricted, et cetera. Like support is really necessary in those instances. So even though there's not a great solution I can kind of share right now, I, I do think like, you know, I work really closely with Kyle and, and the full social team. So um, working with an agency like Hawk can be a, a good way to get a level of support from Facebook as well as strategic advisement. I promise that wasn't a leading question. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, and I like this question, which is if you're smaller, is there a way to partner with other companies or pull your advertising so that you can get further with partners? Have you seen anything like that? I haven't. So we have some policies around when you launch ads for a page, um, you're really only in our terms of service supposed to launch ads for one page per ad account. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about pooling a bunch of your ads and, and running those across multiple pages, it's actually in violation of our policies. So over the time being now, um, hopefully that will change. I'm sure actually there's probably product teams that are interested to hear more about the specific use case that, that you're speaking to, because uh, I don't think it's being worked on to I know that I know of right now. Yeah. And I think it'd be interesting what I've seen and we see it all the time is just even on a large level brands partnering where they're both trying to reach an audience. You see it with the Super Bowl a lot where it's like, why wouldn't AT&T market with Apple for the iPhone? And it's those kind of marketing situations where like you can both spend, you both reach, you know, you may split the audience, but there's, it's probably, you're not like, let's say I cover, uh, you know, $2 million, you cover $2 million. Chances are, we're not both going to get half the audience. We're both going to get 60% of the audience, 70%, because there is going to be some overlap that they buy both, but either way, we both reach the same amount of audience. So it's an interesting strategy, but as you said, you'd would have to, create a campaign, someone's going to have to own that campaign. So like, cause I'm, I'm sure you allow that, like you're going to allow Facebook or sorry, AT&T and Apple to market together, but it has to come from AT&T or from Apple. One of them's going to have to own the marketing. Yeah. And if anyone wants to follow up on that, that tool is called branded content. So you look, you can look into partnering with another business through the branded content tool. Oh, perfect. There you go. Um, well, we have about two more minutes. Anyone have any last minute questions? I want to make sure we get to everyone's. A lot of them have been answered that you'll be reached out to individually. But I, the last one for me, I, I, I know that you said, we've already talked about this, but what in the thoughts on CBD when it comes to Facebook? It's legal in 47 states now, um, from what I recently heard. And there's obviously a ton of demand for it. it what are the, are the thoughts are just waiting for federal regulation? Or is it that they just don't want to be a part of CBD. Like what is the thoughts there around limiting it? And do you think that'll change? Yeah. So, um, broadly things might change. I mean, like you still can't advertise tobacco on the platform, even though tobacco has been legal for a long time. So I think the policy team is just weighing kind of the risks, uh, as they do as like a platform associated with serving a large segment of advertisers in kind of an emerging, I would say, uh, area. So 
right now there's not really like a whole lot that that you can do from an advertising perspective um especially on the ingestible front um but watch the space yep cool well thank you guys so much thank you everyone for joining us and uh feel free to reach out if you have any more questions really appreciate y'all giving us your morning thanks guys happy thank holidays you have a great one bye